Um, I have to tell you guys a story. A couple of um, week weekends ago, somebody uh, asked me to DJ a uh, New Year's Eve party. And I've never DJed before. So this guy was like, no, you got this. You got great taste in music. And I used to be a musician. I said, you can do this. So I was like, all right. So I go to DJ this party. It was New Year's Eve. There's like, I don't know, 400 people at this party. And I spent, because I'm an obsessive compulsive person, I spent like maybe four days like finding songs and building this library and putting together this playlist. They were just gonna be so sick, yo. And I'm gonna, first it's gonna be this thing, and then go to this song, and it was gonna be like, oh, and then I'm gonna play this song, and it's just had the whole thing worked out, and I ran through it like 40 times, and it was like gonna be so good. And then I got on stage in the main stage of the thing, and then people wanted to fight me because they hated the music. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I, I guess, I guess like, what I thought was gonna be cool in my bedroom wasn't necessarily what was cool like in real life. <laughs> so I hope that doesn't happen here. <laughs> because I made this in my bedroom as well. <laughs> Same chair, so it might be cursed. Uh, I just wanna start off by saying that my name is Carvel Wallace and I don't belong in tech. And my goal, if I die happy, is that everyone in tech is someone who doesn't belong in tech. And it's because I believe that there really is no such thing as tech, and that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. So, uh, but I also wanna let you guys know that um, everything I'm gonna say here tonight is something that I'm not entirely sure is true. <laughs> I think it's true, but I could be wrong. And that's important to me because I'm the kind of person with a very low tolerance for BS, including my own, of which I have a lot. And one of the ways in which I see BS propagated is that there's this basic belief that anyone who has a microphone is saying something important. And you can just hand a microphone to any jerk and then that person could be talking. And let's not think that just because I have a microphone I know what I'm talking about. For example, how many of you have ever seen the Tumblr, This Is Not An Insight? Anyone aware of that? That's my favorite Tumblr of all time. Uh, this is the, you know how when you're at a conference and, and you're like networking and stuff and you're tweeting and someone's up there saying stuff and then you start tweeting stuff that they said and you're like, here's this awesome insight about tech that this person said. Well, this is not an insight, it's a collection of tech quotes from Social Media Week in London where people tweet things that they feel are important. And for example, this one says, how do you find bloggers? Twitter and Instagram are the places to look. This is not an insight. This person is literally saying, if you want to find bloggers, look on the computer net. And they'll be there. But that struck this moment at the time. And this one says, ideas, imagination, and digital strategy don't cost you anything. Get people talking about something you're doing. And so what they're saying is, if you want to make a splash on social media, do something that people like. <laughs> This is not an insight. This one says that by finding the leader, you can become the leader. <laughs> deep, right? Um, this is not an insight actually puts the names of the people that tweet this stuff. I don't want to do that to them because they were feeling it in that moment. But so I just want to like, so I, I left that out. But my point is that I just want you to know that like, just because of the people who said this stuff got paid to stand in front of someone with a microphone and treat it as an expert. I just want to say, think of all the good stuff you can do because you're probably brighter than everyone who spoke at this thing. <laughs> this actually is an insight. Uh, Theo Jansen, who's one of my favorite people of all time, said the walls between art and engineering exist only in our minds. And he was talking about art versus engineering, but to me, that has to do with the walls between anything and everything. My whole life is about walls, and that's what I want to talk about today, how to deal with walls, how to break them, or more specifically, how to un unsee them in the first place. Anything I don't like, I just pretend like it doesn't exist. It's pretty much my strategy. <laughs> This is me, this is a picture of me in fourth grade. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and why I don't belong in tech. I was born uh, to a single teenage mother in the 1970s and we were poor and homeless for a long period of time and I struggled through life and I went to 11 different schools and we lived in a car and we got evicted and all this stuff happened and um, I didn't know what to do with my life until I was about 14 and I discovered theater. And when I discovered theater, 
I started hanging out with people who dressed in weird ways, and here you see a picture of me involved in some ridiculous production uh, in New York City when I was about 16, 17 years old, and, um, and uh, I guess I felt like I needed to, there needed to be more of me, because I'm like twice as big now as I was when that happened, but that just means there's more of me to love. And, uh, and, you know, I continued through my life, but because I grew up, you know, poor with a lot of class consciousness, I, I, uh, it was hard for me when I graduated from college to do something like be an artist. And so I got a job. And what my experience was is that if you're a black man, this is in New York City, and you have a degree, it's gonna be, a ma and you're a halfway decent human being, it's only a matter of time before someone comes to you and says, can you work with the youth? And so I did, I did that. I went and worked with the youth, and the first place I got a job at is this building right here. It's uh, the now defunct Spofford Detention Facility for wayward youth in the Bronx, New York. My first job out of college was to work with young kids that were locked up, and I was about three years older than them, and I was terrible at it. But the thing is, I showed up to it every day, and that actually counts, because you can be terrible at something, and then if you keep doing it every day, unless you're a complete idiot, you're gonna get better. And that's what happened to me. I got better at it. I got better at working with young people. I got better at being an employee. And mostly what I struggled with was how to get better at dealing with nonprofits. This began a 15 year career of dealing with nonprofits and social organizations. And I struggled through that. In the meantime, uh, I tried to figure out who I was as a person. You know, I got married at this big wedding and that happened and I had some kids and that happened. And as you can see, I didn't clean my bathtub. That was something that didn't happen. <laughs> I didn't, clean, I didn't clean the bathtub though. But this whole time that I was doing this, I stayed working in nonprofits, even though I had other stuff I wanted to do. I was playing music, I was writing, and all that stuff. But the only thing that I could really do for work was stay in these nonprofits because I had to pay the bills. And, um, and the whole time I was there, I kept asking myself this one question, which is what is the biggest problem we're facing? And how can I fix it? How can I be a part of it? And it never felt to me like what we were doing in nonprofits was actually fixing a problem. It felt like we had agreed on a strategy that was, eh, probably gonna work, not so good, but we're gonna keep doing it because everyone's just giving us money to do it. And I couldn't wrap my head around why that was happening. And so I did that for about 15 years and I ended up getting swept into tech because I live in the Bay Area and I knew someone that worked in tech and she knew I was like a writer and was good with words and had been like, you know, dealing with all kinds of people for years. And so I got a job as a community manager at a startup and that was my first tech job, and I, you know, it's been a few years now, and I'm like the only person I know who has a full career in youth nonprofit and a full career in tech at the same time. And so people always ask me, what's the difference between tech and nonprofit? How do these two places compare and contrast? And for me, I think it's a very important question, and I'll tell you, the difference is, I'm gonna uh, lay them out here, the difference is, is absolutely nothing. That is the difference between tech and nonprofit. There's no difference whatsoever. And that's an important thing. See, in nonprofit, we believe that we're doing the good work, and in tech, we believe, at least in nonprofit, we believe that they were doing the terrible work. And in tech, we believe that we were doing the smart work, and the people in nonprofit were doing the stupid work. But the problem was, we saw this division. And in my experience, there is no division. Or if there is, we have to unsee it. It is incumbent upon us to unsee it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit today about why. I've noticed there are five beliefs that, that are behind what people think is this separation between tech and nonprofit. Belief number one is that doing genuine social good is at odds with revenue. Doing genuine social good is at odds with revenue. I'm not an economist, but I believe that money is made in the following way. I, I make something to solve a problem that you have. You like what I make and it solves your problem and you're willing to give me money for it. And the amount of money you give me for it is more than the amount of money I spend to make it. That's it. I think that's how money is made. <laughs> so, so, if you walk into any nonprofit, any of the youth nonprofits that I've worked at, three of them are within a one mile radius of this building that we're at. If you walk into any of them and you say, do you have a problem to any of the staff members? They'll say, yeah. They say, do you want your young people to succeed and get better and go to school and be independent and be healed and feel good? And they'll say, yes. And they'll say, do you really want that? Like, would you pay for that? I say, yeah, I would pay for that. And then you say, well, is what you're doing now making it happen? And everyone will go, well, we're doing the best we can, but it's not really good enough. That's the nonprofit mantra. We're doing the best we can, but it's not really good enough. 
Can you imagine walking into McDonald's corporate offices and being like, hey, do you guys, are you guys selling a lot of hamburgers? And then being like, well, we're doing the best we can, but we're not really selling. No, they're gonna be like, yes, we're selling so many hamburgers. We sell like 400 million hamburgers the time you ask that question. We're, killing it. we're crushing the hamburgers right now. Right, but in, but in tech, in nonprofit, we say we're doing the best we can, but it's a hard fight and it's not good enough. And if you went to the same, the corporate offices of that same nonprofit, the administrators, and you said, look, do you want to heal the kids? Do you want the youth to feel better? Do you want to solve this problem? They'll say yes, and say, would you pay money for it? Say, we're already paying money for it. We got the, the people, and we're keeping the lights on, and the HR people, and we're doing this. And you say, is it working? And once they put down the brochure and all their song and dance stuff, they'll say, to be honest with you, we're doing the best we can. <laughs> but it's not good enough. And so that to me says that there's a market opportunity there. If you could actually solve a problem that people are emotional about, they'll pay for it. No one's even emotional about Hamburg, but actually I, I, I get emotional. <laughs> That's why I'm twice as big as I was when I took that picture. But and for the most part, people don't get emotional about hamburgers and they'll pay money to have their hamburger problems solved. So imagine how much money people will pay if you could solve their social problems. As a side note, one of the reasons why a nonprofit continues to deliver a product that doesn't work and still make money doing it is that if you think of any product that you know about, Kleenex, iPhones, Miracle Whip, Instagram, whatever, one of the things that happens there is that the product is made in such a way that the people who use it like it. If they don't like it, they don't pay for it. I'm not here to flag wake for, for capitalism. However, at the core, in its purest sense, this one particular thing about capitalism that says, if you like it, you'll pay for it, if you don't, you won't, is actually kind of democratic and populist. And so, when, you, when the product solves your problem, you'll pay money for it. Now, if you're a young person, and you don't like the employment program, or you don't like the social services program, or you don't like the food stamp program, or you don't like the, the any program, what can you do? Can you not pay for it? No, because you're not paying for it in the first place. So the people who are paying for it are the governments, and it's solving a government's problem. The government has a problem, which is that I need people to know that I did some awesome stuff during my administration. Your nonprofit's like, yeah, I got an answer for you. I can solve your problem. Right? Your foundation, your, your $100 million foundation says, I need my shareholders and, and my board members to feel like I'm doing something awesome with this money. That's my problem. Your nonprofit says, I got a solution for you. We're designing solutions for those people because they're the payers. But the young people are not the payers. That is the fundamental problem with the way nonprofit is structured. The user is not the payer. So we continue to give the user a terrible product. We have to change that. That's why we have to put down the wall between nonprofit and tech. Belief number two is that social work is the only way to do something good. <clears throat> I know that I'm short on time, so I'm not gonna go through all these examples. You guys have heard about Indiegogo. Indiegogo can do a lot of things. Some of them are terrible, but some of them are really good. This is my favorite Indiegogo campaign of the last two years. Yeah, exactly. This is my favorite one. I mean, this one raised, what was it, $50,000 to fight the anti-gay law in Singapore in 18 hours. Can you imagine raising that kind of money in 18 hours to do that? You guys, I believe the Twilio is a sponsor of this event, if I'm not mistaken, right? So you guys know that Twilio does the texting, it's sort of set up an interface where you can text something in automatic response. They apply it to human trafficking. So that if, if you are find yourself as a victim of either sexual or labor human trafficking, that you can text and get immediate help without having to pick up a phone and call anyone, which is important for your safety. My favorite sort of do good tech project of all time is the Detroit Water Project. Has anyone ever heard of the Detroit Water Project? Absolutely. One day someone was reading Atlantic Magazine, a woman by the name of Tiffany Ashton Bell was reading uh, uh, um, Atlantic Magazine, and they said, oh look, 8,000 Detroit residents are about to get their water shut off because they can't afford it. And so she built a website over the weekend on rails that allowed people who, were, who wanted to help by sending five or 10 dollars and connecting them with people whose water was about to get shut off. They raised $300,000 in three days. They helped 8,000 people keep their water on. This site still continues, right? If you say that tech can, can't solve any problems or at least can't do anything halfway decent, I present to you this. I wouldn't really be who I was if I didn't plug my own company, which is Vibosity. And what we're trying to do, and I don't know if we'll ever do it, God, I hope if one of you could help us, please talk to me. Um, <laughs> 
We're trying to build a, 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 an app that has elements of games and social uh, media to assess social emotional health uh, for schools and youth environments. I want to take the process of making assessments and asking pe young people how they feel and making it feel like a game. We know that right now that um, all this data is being gathered by advertisers and social media about how young people are feeling and that's just going to advertisers, but we know the people who really need it are the teachers and the youth workers. We want them to have that. So we want to build a product that's fun, that's free, that's, that feels, the, the interface feels lively, where people can actually, young people can have a sense of being able to communicate their feelings and that we can gather data about how the mood, the social mood of like all these youth environments over the course of a week, of a day, of a month, of a year, and make better decisions and prove that what we're doing is or isn't working. Belief number three is that tech people are full of shit, only concerned with selling snake oil to VCs. Actually, that one's kind of true. <laughs> I'm so sorry, that was actually true. But that's why we need you, see? Because people who sell snake oil to VCs are very useful because they're good at getting VC money. And if anyone knows who's ever tried to make something happen, you need money. And in my first year of tech, I worked at a company that raised more money for their app than every nonprofit I worked at for the entire 15 years combined. That is insane. That's not okay. These people are good at raising money. Put yourself in the line of all that money flying around and have an impact on how it's used. Nay, raise the money yourself and control how it's used, where it goes. Don't leave the snake oil salesman all by themselves. They're no better off alone than I am. <laughs> Rule number four, tech is a wealthy white boys club that can't actually help anyone in marginalized communities. Tech as a space is really good at something. It's really good at developing and iterating on ways to solve problems for people. Social work and nonprofit is good at something. It's good at making sure the problems that are solved are actually helpful to the most number of people. In other words, I know that dating and booking travel is really important, but the amount of creative energy tech has put into solving those problems is wildly disproportionate to their social impact. And it's wildly disproportionate to the social impact of other problems like violence, racism, poverty, human trafficking. If we could bring that level of creativity and problem solving to those issues, we might have something. You guys know the app, App Crawler, the website App Crawler? It's like a search engine for apps. So I went into App Crawler and I just wanted to see how many apps appeared for travel. And on this slide I show the screenshot over, this is, these are, there's over 500. That's the most they'll give you. There's more than them. So then I said, well, how many apps have been made about dating? And they said, well, there's over 500 of them. And I said, that's awesome. How many apps have been made that you have the tag equality? And they were like, oh, 12? <laughs> And I said, okay, okay, well, how many apps addressing poverty? And they said, mm, 13. And then I said, well, how many apps addressing justice? And they said, 106, but then it turned out most of them had to do with the Justice, justice League and something related to the, a Justice League game, and if you exclude those, it's like three. And so I ask you, what is a bigger problem? Dating, travel, or social equality and justice? The reason it's like this is because people are really good at solving problems that they have, and they're really bad at solving problems that they don't have. Here's an insight you can quote from me. A problem is best solved by the people that have it. A problem is best solved by the people that have it. We have to be solving our own problems. And if we don't have the resources to do that, we have to get the resources to do that. That's why I believe in unseeing the wall between social work and tech. Belief number five is that a career in tech requires that I know how to code. Let me tell you guys a story. Once upon a time, a developer's partner sent her to the store with the following instructions. Get a loaf of bread, and if they have eggs, get a dozen too. So the developer came back with 13 loaves of bread. <laughs> I'll give everyone a chance to catch up. The joke, of course, is that it's <laughs> get a loaf of bread, if they have eggs, get a dozen too, but see, the person didn't say get a dozen eggs, they just say get a dozen, so we heard loaf of bread. Um, the joke, of course, is that 
when we, we, when we excel at using one part of our brain, we become below average at using the others. This, this is true individually, thank you, and collectively. If we get really good at using the part of our brains that, for example, that make money, we become poor at using the part of our brains that act with kindness. If we get good at using the part of our brains that work quickly, we get poor at using the part of our brains that represent impact. And so, this happens individually, but collectively. Our collective brain, I like to think of every person as part of one big brain cell. And right now, the people who need get 13 loaves of bread are like r driving, they're like running the ship. And we need other people to come in there and be like, no, you only need the one loaf of bread and just get the eggs. That way we'll have breakfast. See what I mean? <laughs> You'll notice that a long time ago, maybe you didn't, that a few slides ago, I stopped saying the word tech. Because the promise of this talk is that there's no, there's no such thing as tech. I, I would propose that we call it work which is an activity involving mental and physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result. What if there was no tech? What if there was no nonprofit? What if there was no sector for social good, right? What if there was just work? Then the focus would be on the ideas, not on the people. Then anyone could feel like they could do anything. Then the best thinkers for each problem would feel that it was within their power to solve that problem. They would not be gated off by an idea that the work is taking place in some other backyard that they don't have the key to. We'd all be playing on the same playground, and then maybe, just maybe, we'd stop separating ourselves by who we are, we'd start coming together about what we're trying to do. So I, my suggestion to us is let's get to work. Thanks a lot. <laughs>